Roger Bennett, broadcaster, podcaster, filmmaker, Men in Blazer co-host, proud American. And uh, his uh, memoir, Reborn in the USA, an Englishman's love letter to his chosen home, now available online and uh, wherever books are sold. Although, Raj, how English were you yesterday during the Euros? Dan Patrick, I want to make it clear. I ride with Team America now. You know, the uh, it took me writing a book about how much I love America for England to actually throw off the shackles of self-loathing, self-sabotage, and just 55 years of <laughs> crapping their pants in massive games against Germany. I feel a little bit like Jonah and the Whale. However, I am genuinely happy for that nation. They have suffered in lockdown. And to watch large men take off their shirts, just let it all hang out and soak themselves in beer. My God, they deserve it. But if I had a camera on you yesterday watching England beat Germany, what would I have seen? A large man with his shirt off. Uh, <laughs> <thrown in. laughs> I mean, I do. When, I want to be clear. When the United States play England, as they do in the Women's World Cup, where our women destroy the English and Alex Morgan knocks her head back and mimes drinking tea, I am like, yes, in the face. Take that, Piers Morgan, you <laughs> bastard. Um, so I, that, that is where my allegiances are. But, you know, my family are all there. I know the joy that it's bringing them. I do know when you had an empire and you no longer have an empire, that leaves an incredible vacuum. In that vacuum, there's been dreams, shattered dreams, hopelessness, self-loathing. It's a little bit like the Red Sox 2004 dreaming over and over again, Sisyphus pushing the boulder up the hill only to have the Yankees knock it back down. What we saw yesterday was the English breaking through like the Red Sox, but probably unlike the Red Sox, the English will now crap the bed against Ukraine in the next <laughs> round and find a completely different way to torture the nation. But it is, it's a lovely moment. And if you are pro-happiness, which I like to think I am, if you're pro-joy, and if you are of a belief, you know, a lot of people think sports about winning and their team, if they win, are better people. And if their team lose and the, the losers are worse people, I don't believe that. I do believe sports is human theatre. And I believe that it allows us to make incredible memories that sustain us in time of light and in time of darkness. And so I'm so happy for all of these English fans that they will, they will, they will remember this day, this yesterday's joys the germans such a demon in their minds they slayed the dragon they caught the white whale and i'm so i genuinely to be candid dan i'm so happy for them when we acquired you what did we give up and like was this uh just we just acquired you your rights from uh from liverpool I was a player to be named later in the uh, in the revolutionary um, <laughs> truth. I, I was just some some scrub who could give a couple of innings um, in, in 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 pretty uh, light relief. Um, what did you gain uh, by by adding me? I mean, I think that, and this is why I wrote the book. And we tried to give you Madonna. We tried yeah. to give you Courtney Love, Gwyneth Paltrow. We've tried to give you some people. You've got to keep your voice down because Madonna listens to the show. She actually does think she's English <laughs> at this point in her life and her biography. <laughs> and it's funny. Her accent changed immediately. My accent, I love America. I know I don't sound very American, but I love America like, you know, Kenny Powers loves America. And the accent <laughs> is the one thing that's not true. I can't, I can't even do it. I know on this show, you like make Christian Pulisic speak English. You make Rebecca Lowe speak American. I can't do any of that. Like I can say like, hooray for Hollywood. But I can't say anything. <laughs> okay, never, but how is it that Madonna goes to England and then she acquires an accent in two hours? Well, I can tell you how that works. Because English managers, English football managers... Famously, Steve McLaren, who is a character, like a meme, a human meme on the manager, an English guy, went to manage in Holland, the Netherlands, for a club team. And like within two press conferences, was like, um, yes, uh, it's a good game we play today. Uh, it's on YouTube. And there's a, another guy, Joey Barton, he's from near me, Liverpool. He went to play in France. And he's like, again, second press conference. He's like, yeah, I think he was... You know, the win is important. And what I've learned, it is hilarious. It is hilarious to watch because it's like, oh, my God. I mean, Weston McKinney is an amazing young guy. 
uh, plays for Juventus, a powerhouse in Italy, out of Dallas, Texas. And like his third game, I think, um, he like missed a, a chance and he runs off the goal and he's like, to the camera, he's like, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, hey. Right. I, th- I think that the, the speech thing, because I have actually, I've wondered, why do I not have an American accent? I think it's because if you have a musical ear, then, and I assume Madonna probably, arguably, may or may not have a musical ear, but I'm assuming she does. Uh, you immediately change and adapt to the voice around you. I have no musical ear. I've been trying to learn the banjo for about uh, for about the last 110 years, going nowhere with that. And it's because I don't have a musical ear, and that's why I still sound like this. But you asked me, like, to become American, that's why I wrote the book, is uh, to, have, to, have, to have stood in, in a, a, a courtroom in Manhattan with 161 fellow new Americans being sworn in with the oath of allegiance, and, you know, America in times of wonder, America in times of challenge. I will say I look left and right to be in that courtroom and to look at my fellow new Americans. You know, I'd escaped, you know, a couple of football matches where the violence went dodgy, some chip shop beatings late at night when the pub shut in England. These people had escaped civil war, unrest, famine. I mean, just the stories were incredibly humanly touching. And the one thing that joined all of us in that room was the power of the idea of America. So I think when you have human beings like me, you are adding individuals who've dreamed about America, who've drawn strength from America in dark times, the idea of America, courage, tenacity, possibility. And ultimately, that's what you uh, add by adding me, another bald man who thinks he can broadcast but loves America in the face. The memoir is reborn in the USA, an Englishman's love letter to his chosen home. We're talking to Roger Bennett, the broadcaster, podcaster, filmmaker, Men in Blazers co-host. Your first introduction to American sports was what or who? (sighs) Chicago Bears, 1983, just starting to throw off the shackles. The NFL was broadcast for the first time on a niche channel in England for an hour every week. 14 games in those uh, every weekend in those days. And they crushed all 14 games down to a highlight reel of one hour. I've, I've said a couple of times, it's like, it was all put to Bonnie Tyler's holding out for a hero. It was like Tony Dorsett sweeping left. And it'd be da dum dum da dum 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 da Very dramatic. Remember, English football in those days was played by angry men who wanted to kick anything on the muddy pitches, be it the ball or their opponent, and then go off to the pub and have a cigarette, a pie and a pint. So like to see Billy White Shoes Johnson return a kickoff for 83 yards, but he only did it so that when he got there, he could just unleash the funky chicken, like 13 year old me was like, holy crap, joy, wisdom, wonder, um, you know, to see New Orleans Saints fans you know, under Bum Phillips. I, first of all, I was like, my God, there's a man called Bum. And then they were hopeless. <laughs> they, they were like, oh, and 14. And again, in England, if your team was losing that much, you would go to the games just to fight your opponent's fans and taste your own blood in your mouth. But the New Orleans Saints fans, they were like, we love this. We're the New Orleans Saints. And they pulled on paper bags over their heads and just had a great time. And I was like, my Lord, trying to find joy, even in defeat. That is, that is a, that's a wonderful way to live a life. But the Chicago Bears, I always, my family left Europe in the early 1900s thinking they were headed to Chicago. So my family always in dark times, and there were many of them in Liverpool in the 1980s, we'd always be like, we should have lived there. We should have lived there. So to watch this Bears team, Walter Payton, Jim McMahon, William Refrigerator Perry, throw off the shackles of defeat, self-loathing, and just a pathetic franchise and say, no, we swagger, we Super Bowl shuffle, we dominate, and we trash talk on our way to victory. 13-year-old me was like, you don't have to be who you are. You are not trapped by history. You can redefine yourself. And it was thrilling on a sporting level, and it taught me life lessons on a personal level then. But do you have friends growing up who look at you and say, like, what are you doing? Like you, you, you're a traitor. You left us behind. Like, did you get like feedback, blowback by becoming an American citizen? Um, I shared this dream with another friend of mine in Liverpool. We would because the games were on the NFL games, and we knew they were being played a week on television. They were a week old, and there was no internet. So me and my friend Jamie, we would from his house, not mine, because my dad would have killed me. We used to phone up random 312 Chicago um, numbers during Bears games and people were they hello? 
And we'd be like, hey, how are the Bears doing? And they'd be like, oh, Matt Sui's just run for four <laughs> yards. And we'd be like, yeah, now what's happening? And they'd be like, Jim McMahon's dropped back. Oh, he's just uh, overthrown that one to Willie Gold. And we'd be like, and we'd get them to give us personal commentary and run up just enormous <laughs> phone bills. So I shared this dream with my best friend. And it's what the book's about, about loving you know, everything, heart to heart, Fantasy Island, John Hughes movies, Run DMC, the Beastie Boys. And Miami Vice came on our screens, Dan, and watching Don Johnson, um, you know, just in his pastels, in his T-shirt, in his rolled up sleeves, and his never any socks, and his hair that became blonder with every consecutive season of the show, gunning down narco threats in a spadrials. I realized that to be... Willing in life to succeed, you have to have A, a singular style, B, stick with it, and then C, not care about what anybody else says about you. And so that's what I took from Miami Vice. That was my attitude. I didn't, I, I learned not to care. I also started to wear spadrilles with no socks, which are completely <laughs> impractical for Liverpool. But um, I've learned not to care about what other people think, though. It's like you were an American trapped in an Englishman's body. That is the opening paragraph of my book. I persuaded myself because my family wanted a move there and ended up by mistake in Liverpool because my great-grandfather, he's down here. There he is. God love him. Harris Pollock. That's him in the Russian army where he had to serve for 25 years. And then he fled Ukraine and he was headed to Chicago. He was a butcher. He wanted to become a butcher in the hog capital of the world. And the, 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 the myth of the Liverpool Jewish community is that it's full of the idiots who, when the boat docked to refuel in Liverpool, saw the one tall building on the Liverpool skyline. I'm like, we're in New York. Let's go. <laughs> and so we got off and we were in Liverpool. And Liverpool is the greatest city in the world. I want to be clear. But in the 80s, as the North economically, politically, culturally just descend. You've seen Billy Elliot, you've seen the mining devastation, the cotton, the steel, just the post-industrial Britain. There was a wasteland. And so I did. I survived uh, this very dark black and white life by inhaling American sports, American culture. And yes, Dan, I tell myself at night, I had the Statue of Liberty painted on my bedroom wall I would arrange my curtains so that the light fell on her face. And I'd persuade myself that I, I was an American trapped in an Englishman's body, even though I'd never set foot in America. That's, that's the story you tell yourself to be able to get through. Will the U.S. men win a World Cup in our lifetime? Yes. Yes, if they... Um... If science allows us to live forever, then the answer is definitely <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I can tell you, I can tell you, Ted Williams will definitely be alive yeah, yeah. Uh, and walking the earth by the time <laughs> the American men. Look, if the American men were, uh, can become half as good as our women, they can be bloody, bloody good. And the reality is I moved to America in, right before the last World Cup. And on Men in Blazers, we always joke, Saka! America's sport of the future, as it has been since 1972. It's always meant to be the next big thing. That It, it was never an overnight success. It's been slow and steady. The, the, there's a huge audience consuming consuming the Euros right now. And our men have gotten to it. There's a young wave of incredible talent. Christian Pulisic. I mentioned Weston McKinney. I mean, I mentioned Tyler Adams. Uh, there's a slew of these, Geo Reyna, a slew of these young stars. And for the first time, in your lifetime, young stars are willing to go abroad to play against the best for the best. They're not sticking around in America anymore. There's a young wave of talent who will make us very proud sooner than we think. Is there somebody else in England we should acquire? Whew. Well, we tried that with Piers Morgan. And yeah, it we didn't, didn't, we didn't well, want did him. No, <laughs> we, we returned him. We didn't want him. We got him. It didn't work very well. I, I think we I think we've got we've got we've got i like our i like our cast of characters and it is it is amazing in the past you know america america did well by having air bases in strategic footballing countries germany and we'd we had a lot of dual nationals but the is beckham the, ours not really i don't think i think he's got the english flag tattooed about 87 times on his person <laughs> that's just the ones we know about the ones he keeps secret we have no <laughs> what about Ed Sheeran? Is is Ed Sheeran ours now? Why would you want Ed Sheeran when you've got <laughs> Kevin Herter, who is the Ed, Ed Sheeran? Ed Sheeran is just the poor man's red velvet. Let's be candid. Let, let's be candid. <laughs> Do you think Kevin Herter is just a taller Ed Sheeran? 
with talent. Yeah. And, and a better <laughs> jumper. I actually, I actually watched in the Royal Box yesterday, um, watching England, and they showed the Beckham shot with Sheeran. And my first impulse was, oh, my God, Kevin Hurd is sitting by, <laughs> sitting by Beckham. God love him. Ginger, power, you go for it, Kev. Nobody um, wants to sit next to Beckham as good looking as he is. Um, he gets better and better and better looking. That is the, the remarkable thing. He is. He is. I mean, it's like Ronaldo. Um, who Cristiano Ronaldo is like 35, 36. And everyone's like, oh, this could be his last big tournament. Do you the think un- Ronaldo's had a little help? Like Ted Williams' help. A little, work, kind of- a little work done. Um, I think I've got to be candid. Ronaldo seems to be learning lessons about life. His eyebrows, he used to overpluck in a devastating fashion. And he, he did, everyone thinks he's just about himself. That guy's clearly listened to feedback because he's filling them out. He's letting them go. <laughs> I, I, I think he is gorgeous. I am team messy, just to be totally candid. But you have to admire this human being that is driven by a constant drive for self-improvement and human wonder. I once stayed in his hotel room at the Euros after Portugal had been defeated um, and then I moved into the hotel when Portugal left. I was in Donetsk in Ukraine, which I would really recommend for Americans who are looking to um, to travel to a off the uh, off the road tourist spectacle. And I moved into his hotel room. They'd vacated maybe twelve hours earlier. And all I will tell you for the next eleven days, the Dracon War cloud that still hung to me vicariously by moving in there <laughs> was was just immense. And I. Um, I lived a, a tiny bit of his life. He is a gentleman that takes care of himself in in wonderful ways, and we should all be so blessed to. I mean, God, look at me. I'm in no. I am in no. <laughs> I'm in no position to start commenting on Cristiano Ronaldo, Ben Patrick. Ah, uh, great to talk to you as always, Roger. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us on. Thank you, America. And have Courage. a have a great Fourth of July. Oh, mate, this is the book for it. I never take a single day in America for granted, Dan. Thank you. That's uh, Courage. Roger Bennett, reborn in the USA, an Englishman's love letter to his chosen home.